and Tom. He's a uh, research faculty with us up on the third floor. And Tom's greatest distinction is that he survived two absolutely soul-destroying graduate experiences. <laughs> the first at Sydney Uni with uh, Tony Underwood, which if you ever worked in Australia, you know the horrors of being around him. And then the other one was with our Murdoch. And Tom, so Tom's been here for, I think, what, eight years now? That's right, yeah. Working on stock assessments and the development of what's called the DLM toolkit, which is spreading worldwide as a, a software system to help people with limited fisheries data do stock assessments. Oh, was that quick enough? Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, okay, <laughs> thanks so much everybody for coming out to the report. It's great to have you here. Um, I'm really sorry, it's kind of a snarky title, isn't it? Like, it's, <laughs> it's, I'm really sorry about that. But there's a couple of reasons for that. One is it makes for more interesting seminar. Another is that I don't really have a boss anymore. So, I can say what I think. The only person who's going to embarrass is me. Uh, and that's normal anyway. And I suppose the third thing is that this is my home crowd, right? This is the IOF, so uh, it's only about 50% hostile. Uh, and as far as, as far as audiences go, that's pretty good for me, actually. So, like, we've already had uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly from Marie on state-space modeling. And I just racked my brain. I was like, oh, I need a face for, the, for each of these. I need a face for the inconvenient, the incoherent, and the inexcusable. In the end, I only needed one. There he is. <laughs> <laughs> I think the inconvenience being a little kind, actually. But there we go. So today we're going to be talking about operating models and MSC. So let's all get on the same page about what this is, okay? The example I'm going to give you is of a management procedure. That's something that takes in data and spits out a management recommendation. And the one we're going to use an example here is something that takes in length data, like size samples, and gives a catch recommendation. Now what you need to know about an operating model is that it is just a simplified representation of the major components of a real fishery system, right? So we have stock dynamics, things grow, they die, they reproduce. We have fleet dynamics, we have species targeting, spatial targeting, we have gears that select for different length classes and so on. And just like in reality, true lengths are taken from that population. But we don't see those perfectly, right? So we have an observation model. And that creates the type of data that we would typically see. So an infrequent and problematic uh, assortment of length samples, which goes into our MP, and then out comes a catch limit, a TAC recommendation, for example. And that isn't always taken perfectly. There could be overages, underages, and variability. So we have an implementation model, and it feeds right back into the stock and the fleet dynamics. So these are the real catches subject to implementation. So what we've got is a transparent and accountable representation of our fishery system. And we can do cool stuff with this, right? So first of all, we can project into the future, go round and round and round and round and round, and see which management procedures work for our fishery. We can also see the circumstances under which they fail. What stock dynamics, in theory, are going to cause our management procedure to screw up? How much, for example, length data do we have to gather of what type in order for our management procedure to work? Because we have transparent and accountable representation of our fishery system, we can start to do things. And it is only by rec fully recognizing that we don't know all these things that we can start to learn about the things that are most important. Okay, so that's what an operating model is. Management strategy evaluation evaluates MPs using this, this simulated uh, reality, as it were. We're building operating models all over the place. We focused on North America, but we're branching out in partnership with the FAO and others into international waters. Hopefully, by the end of this year, we'll have 100 of these system dynamics models, so more than 100, we'll see. Uh, but right now, our principal partners are the Canadian DFO, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the Marine Stewardship Council. For this 
first part of my talk, we need to identify some players so I can demonstrate some points. These are what's going to show what's inconvenient. We're going to simulate an assessment. This is a state space delay difference model, courtesy of Quang, where is he? Over there. Um, so this represents a simplified stock assessment. We're going to have FMSY management, we're going to have no fishing, we're going to have average catches, which is a really dumb approach, it just says, here's what the historical catches were, let's just do the average, you'll be alright. <laughs> then we've got uh, maturity size limit, that is a size limit exactly following our maturity schedule. We're going to have an index target approach, that just says, are we above our relative abundance index? If we are, we can catch more. Are we below it? You can catch less. Very simple. Current effort, that's like our status quo. That says we're going to carry on doing what we're doing right now. CMSY I've included because two weeks ago Rainer Fraser gave a talk about that, so I thought we'd include it. And last of all, we're going to close 20% of the fishery, the habitat of that fishery, we're going to close it in an MPA. And we're going to reallocate that effort to the rest of the fishery. So we're not reducing effort, we're just moving it. So, these are our players, what's our playing field? Each one of these lines is, is a projected simulation. It's one of those loops in the operating model going round and round and round. And in some cases, biomass is dropping, and in other cases, spawning biomass is staying high. We're going to have two performance metrics. One is going to be based on spawning biomass, and we're going to record how often it drops below this threshold, half of uh, BMSY. That's a fundamental reference point for both US rebuilding, so when a stock drops below that level, we're going to rebuild fisheries. It's also in things like the Marine Stewardship Council advice, and, and, and it's a key reference point there as well. It's quite common. The other um, metric we're going to look at is yield. We're going fishing, we want food, we're out here to get money, so we care about yield. And what, exactly the same way, we're going to monitor yield, but this time, we're going to work out how often in the part or the size of it in the last 10 years. We're going to call that long-term yield. And that's just how much yield we got at the end of the time period. That's a really useful metric. Because if you think about it, if you overfish, you crash the stock, you don't get good long-term yield. If you underfish, you don't get lots of yield because you're fishing lower than you could be. So long-term yield encapsulates that. So it's quite a useful metric and it's used in a bunch of different places where we do this type of modeling. So here's our claims field, it's a trade-off plot. We have the probability of dropping below, or, or probability of staying above this on the x-axis and the long-term yield on the y-axis. We want things up in the top right-hand corner, and we don't want things in the bottom left. We want biological sustainability, but we want yields. And you can see this um, NP is doing well. And NP, this thing here is doing pretty well. Okay, now we know what the rules of the game are, let's start talking about what's so inconvenient. So, the first on my whistle-stop tour of operating model <laughs> inconveniences is California red sea urchin. Okay, there's only one thing you need to know about California sea urchin. In fact, there's two things you need to know. To be pretty sure it's sustainable. And that is that it's a dive fishery, and it's highly selective, and it's a fishery for row. So, there's not a lot of dead discarding, and they're only interested in mature individuals. So it's a going out fishery. So that, by virtue of those two things, you can have a huge amount of uncertainty in almost all other aspects of the model, and still have a sustainable fishery when you simulate and test it. And you see this, right? So here's our trade-off plot. All of our management procedures are doing pretty well. They're all up here in the top uh, right-hand corner. Critically, current effort, the red one, is doing really well. So just the status quo is not that harmful in this fishery, it seems. This is all down to that fishing dynamics. If we replace the fishing dynamics in this model with a soft bottom trawl with high discard mortality, this is what we get. A completely different picture. So what you're seeing is, I just lost my line. What you're seeing is that fishing dynamics is an undeniable determinant of performance and it's an undeniable determinant of what management procedure we would pick. 
So we have to add to our list of things we care about, we have to consider, we have to start with fleet dynamics. And in this simplified model, we see that fleet dynamics are critical, right? Onto Atlantic butterfish, here we are on the eastern seaboard of the USA. Three things you need to know about butterfish. It is short-lived, so very few butterfish go past an age of about four. That means the population is made up of only a few cohorts. So there's only a maximum human population, but there's people are only one, two, three, and four. Okay? The next thing you need to know is that it seems to be very resilient to fishing. So what you can see here is you're getting close to unfished recruitment, even at very low stock sizes. And the last thing you need to know about butterfish is that it has very high recruitment variability. So what we've got is a perfect storm of three things that disconnect our management from impacts on the stock. This thing's going to move around a lot naturally. So we don't expect, especially in the terms of biomass, management procedures to have a big impact. And that's what we see. So on the biomass spectrum, they're all stacked up quite comparably. <coughs> There's big differences in yield. Now, look at the top three, mat size limit, MPA, and current effort. They all have compensatory dynamics. When the stock is low, you catch less for the same boats on the water, right? Current effort is the same. It compensates for those natural fluctuations. So input controls are working really well for something with these stock dynamics. But in the USA, we cannot apply them by law. Because in a federal fishery in the, in the US, you have to set catch limits, which means that these are out of consideration for us in our, in our fishery. The best performing things are things we can't do. We've got another problem with butterfish, and that is, if we were serious about this probability of biomass metric, if we didn't want low levels of this, then we have to go no fishing. Look at no fishing. This is telling us that even if we don't do a thing, this population is going to drop below 50% BMSY. Well, how is that possible? Well, it's totally possible. You've seen how much variability we expect. So this is the projection of butterfish, and this is from unfished. So unfished conditions with no fishing, plenty of simulations drop below our threshold, just due to natural variability. So we have two problems here. In fact, we have three things working against us. We have the population dynamics that move around a lot. We have management objectives, which we may not be able to meet. And we have the things we can do, because we can't have input controls. So whenever we talk about now, about what the right management approach is, oh no, we have to add three new things to our list. We have to consider those things. Next example. Indian Ocean Yellowfin tuna. I put this right after butterfish because it has the same resilience to fishing and it has the same recruitment variability. So, but what's the difference here with butterfish is that it's slightly longer lived. So just that one aspect of it is completely different from butterfish. We can assess it and do really well. So the assessment's doing really well. Do you want to know something interesting? This operating model is the stock synthesis assessment model. So the stock synthesis assessment model is telling us that we can use a simple assessment. It's telling us there's no extra benefit to be had in this top corner, how much space is there to the top right of assessment? Not much. So we've already learned something that we don't have to be using complicated approaches to get good performance out of this fishery. It's really interesting finding. But as it turns out, in the actual workshop where we talked about these things, I, they said, oh, well, we don't really stick to the TACs. And I thought to myself, really? So you're like 10% over? Are you 20% over? They said, oh, could be as much as two or three times higher. So bam, what happens? They all sit just like they did in the original um, butterfish example. All of them suddenly sit in the same biological space. They're all stacked up there. Why? Because we've disconnected the part of those control systems, those MPs, with the real stock dynamics. We've got such a huge overage, it no longer matters which management procedure we're using. If it's the one on the left-hand side, we can use a simple assessment. If it's the one on that side, on the right-hand side, we can just carry on doing whatever we're doing. 
it's a ship, it's just cruising with no possible impact of how we decide to manage it. How much money would you spend on stock assessment in this fishery? <laughs> okay, so ugh, now we've got a new thing to worry about. It matters how well we implement our management. That's going to control what FP we choose. Ah, and it's going to interact with population dynamics. Welcome to the world of uh, warty sea cucumber. This is Adrian's pet nightmare. Um, warty sea cucumber, sea cucumber in California. We know the catch history, kinda. We know the CPUE, kinda. And we don't know much else about it. So there's a huge amount of uncertainty about what the status and life history of warty sea cucumber is. For that reason, when we do our MSC analysis, we get a huge spread in performance, both in the biological yield space. But note that, how many of these things can we apply if we know nothing? We can't apply a maturity size limit because we don't know when they're mature, so that's out. Okay. We can't do an assessment because we can't weigh catches. These things take on water and lose it, they shrink. So we can't do a size limit or assessments. It kind of rules out most of the catch implementation methods as well. So we're left with a strange situation where we could continue to do what we're doing currently, or we could do a 20% MPA. But then we need to know where they are to have the MPA, right? So we're in a situation, it's an extreme situation, but it makes the point that data availability clearly controls what we can and can't do in a fishery. If we don't have certain data types, we can't do certain things. That's really obvious, right? California barred sea bass is a really good example. Here is the map for <laughs> barred sea bass. Note, the observant people amongst you will note that the distribution stops and California ends and then there's ocean. I mean, of course what we're forgetting is that there's Mexico, right? And our barred sea bass move up and down the coast, right? Well, they move easily on the way down. On the way up, they have to swim like under a wall to get back up. But anyway, so, so, so what's the problem here? This is an incredibly interesting case of the non-intuitive properties of data and implementation at hand. We're now in the realm of the theoretical, but bear with me, okay? Let's say that twice the TAC that's set in California is actually taken. The same again is taken in Mexico. And let's say that you never see that, they don't report it, so the catches are half what they really are. Why is our assessment doing well? It's doing well because it sees a small stock. It sees half the catches. So it sets a small TAC, which is then doubled, because they just take twice as much. But then they feed back into it half the catches that were really taken. It's fine. Balances itself out. In any fishery where the fraction that's taken, the overages, the implementation error, matches the under-reporting in catches, if it could do that, you don't have a problem. If you now, allow for unbiased catches, your assessment says it's big, it sets a big TAC, and that's doubled. Now you're in trouble. Now you're in trouble. Everything now is causing problems. This is counterintuitive to a lot of people. So now, when we're thinking about the interaction of all these things, oh no, we've got to add data quality. Because we care now about how good things are reported and how precise they are. And clearly, when different management procedures need different types of data, the relative qualities of those things will determine what we should do. If something is using an index, and you have a really good index, it's going to be well. So this is pretty obvious so far. But what we've got here is a really interesting interaction between the data quality, the enforcement characteristics, and the population dynamics, this transboundary stock. All right. And it's short lived and has high resilience and starts at uh, a low level, maybe you're okay, you can do that quickly. But if it's long lived and your stock is low, you've got a problem. Conversely, if your stock is doing fine, you can meet all your objectives depending on the life history and fishery. So this interacts with almost all these things. We have eight dimensions, we have eight things to think about. I have given you a set of examples that are as clear as I can about the relevance on this list of those things, about why we should have them on here. I've tried to make it, and in doing so, I've oversimplified. 
because all the other operating models we deal with have little bits of all these things. They have little bits of data that are missing, and something that's really precise. San Francisco Bay Herring has a fantastic index, a fantastic index, and they catch 10% under their TAC. So you can pursue a management procedure that if you took it to another herring fishery, it would be seriously problematic for the biology. All these things add up. This is the space we're working in, right? So I've heard a lot of very established, celebrated fisheries professors telling me that these are the details, that these are the technicalities, that we should be broader in our thinking or something like that. This is absolutely wrong-headed, I'm telling you this. This is the world we live in. If you work in fisheries management, this is the world you live in, and this is just theoretically. This is just using a systems dynamics model. This isn't the real world, but there's all kinds of other gnarly problems. So these aren't the details, these are the fundamentals. You can turn on and off parts of this space, and you get different conclusions about how to manage your fishery. If somebody tells you, we're going to use this for everything, you should immediately be like, wait a second, really? You know, it's a difficult problem. And this is the inconvenient truth about fisheries management. We keep finding that every place we go, we get a different conclusion. Something that works somewhere else just due to one thing is totally unacceptable. And this is really inconvenient, right? Super inconvenient. But luckily we have Adrian. I've got a nice big picture of you down here. You're shy of retiring. Um, we're trying to make it convenient. So I came up with a kind of proof of concept for building these models quickly so that we could not fall into these traps. And basically, Adrian's run with it and has made it basically the fastest, most powerful operating model we have available to us. And look, it's a face for radio, but, <laughs> but he's brilliant. He's absolutely brilliant. And, um, and you know, this thing, is, this thing I, is absolutely incredible because of his involvement. So we're trying to make this convenient. We're trying to give people the tools to navigate this complicated space. The incoherent, it immediately arises from the inconvenient, right? You go to, you go to a place, you build an operating model, or a bunch, and you start realizing things about what they're doing. So maybe their data collection priorities don't make sense. Think of California Sea Urchin and, and Walter Sea Cucumber. Should you be putting lots of effort into improving management of urchin when you could have this massive potential difference to, to see you remember. How often should we do assessments? Some of these things say you don't have to do it that often. Others you have to do it really frequently. How complicated should our management procedure be? That was the elephant example where our simple state-based stock assessment left almost no room for improvement theoretically. How should we prioritize our species for management? This one I love. Organization of meetings. I have been to, I build these operating models for meetings, and I see that various aspects of it are just inconsequential. I sat through four hours, I won't tell you the venue, but I sat through four hours of discussion, heated discussion, on length length relationships. Like, like four clengths and I length. It has no bearing at all on the impact of management, particularly not what you would choose. And so you could even use this to prioritize your meeting time. Um, it tells you, are you really aiming for something that's possible? Should we be aiming for no, you know, no probability of dropping to low levels for something like butterfish? Is it realistic? The number of times we've been to a setting where people have wanted something that is not possible, even with no fishing, would shock you. And also, sometimes the legal frameworks within which, we, with, within which we work are too restrictive and they rule out potentially quite useful management options. The problem with this, right, is that no one wants to hear, no one wants to hear this, right? So you come here with your flashy model, you know, and, you, know you drag Adrian along and, and, you know, it looks like we're like doing this great thing, but no one wants to hear it because it's, it's different often from what they're doing already. So what do they do? The first thing they do, and they're quite right to do it, is they start to critique the operating model, which is right. We should all be critical of our models, right? 
we should all be doing this. We should have this kind of responsibility to question what we're doing all the time. And that's fine. And this is a great strength of this, that we can all get involved in making the right model. But it does start to make you wonder how they were doing these things before. I mean, if this transparent, accountable framework is telling you to do something and you don't like it, like, what, why were you doing what you were doing before? Like, why are you spending four hours on length of relationships? Why are you... You see, this is the bit that got to me after a couple of years of doing this. I was like, I tell you what, there are some places where people are strategic, don't get me wrong, but don't rely on me. Ask your fishing manager why they're doing what they're doing. Just see how far that goes, what the final answer you get is. And the answer is they have an operating model. They have one. They have an operating model. It's in their head, right? It's an idea about how systems work and what the impacts of management would be. It's in their head. It's a working paradigm, an average fishery concept. The argument I'm making is that we're asking too much of people to operate and think reliably in this very complicated space. That's the argument I'm making. That we need models to do that. And the other argument I'm going to make is that if you allow people to manage according to this operating model that isn't transparent and accountable, what happens when there are differences of opinion? How do we resolve them? Okay. Here's a really good example of some incoherence, right? So in a unnamed management setting, sorry, um, they flew a lot of people in to have a harvest control rule workshop. Harvest control rules throttle fishing in response to depletion, basically. And they put out radically different harvest control rules, and they sat around for a week, and they decided what they were going to use and what the threat, and they never did an MSU or anything. That, that's all the harvest control rules piled on top of each other. That was like, what, 100,000 bucks or something? You see, it's all going well until you start seeing the amount of money that's being spent on things where people can't really say why they're doing it. The average fishery concept says we have to get a survey for everybody that has to be every two years. We have to have this many length samples. We have to have a stock assessment, that's best. It says all those things, and yet I can't find any such generality, even in the theoretical models that we're building. Here are three findings that are designed to irk you. Let's say, uh, let's say stimulate your internal operating model that you work on. If you're finding yourself getting annoyed right now, ask yourself why. Because even two years ago, I would have found this annoying. And when I explain it to you, you'll go, oh, okay, well, okay. But I had to explain it to you, right? So more data can be worse. There's three parts to this. The first is that clearly, more bad data is worse. You would be shocked, however, in how many settings people say we need to get all the data into this model, everything, all of it. We need to get all of it. And you would say to them, well, that index is pretty unreliable. They're like, no, 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 no. So you have to get it all in there. As though somehow that data can be non informative or helpful. But of course, it can be misinformative, right? Bad data can tell you the wrong things. If you know that, you just don't include it. The second type of data that can be worse is clearly a misallocation of data. You're spending your time improving a particular assessment or process and you're not spending it where it could be used. It's making no difference. That's pretty obvious too. But the third one is really counterintuitive and no one likes it. And that is that more good data can be worse. And this is the bit where you're like, what are you talking about, right? <laughs> so I've heard at least two very celebrated um, scientists telling me that if you provide perfect information to all of your management procedures, they'll all work really well. I mean, that, that is a staggering amount of crap. Because if you look at the trade-offs places, we know that some will work well and some won't. They have a risk profile. They have a risk profile that is specific to the operating model conditions, right? So the idea, if it's doing something risky, let's say only something risky is available to you, if you give it more quality of data, you're just feeding the beast. And it does what it does better. And so it was going to overfish, it overfishes more regularly. And we see it. We see negative value of information. People don't want to see that. It makes no sense to them. They get defensive. NPAs can be harmful. The debate about NPAs goes on and on, right? These are the marine reserves we're talking about. Um, 
But generally, the debate is about whether or not they are of no benefit or some benefit. You know, we don't really recognise that there could be rare, admittedly rare situations, although not that rare actually in the, in the world I work in, where they could be harmful. I want you to take a specific example. An otherwise rational person that I've spoken to will agree that we have a growth overfishing problem in bluefin tuna. We catch them too small. They'll also agree that we're worried about bycatch as a primary conservation measure. And they'll also agree that post-2009, TACs have been restrictive for bluefin tuna. They're meeting our conservation goals. We're underfishing. We expect it to rebuild, even though the assessments are super uncertain. Those three things, and yet they will promote a spawning area closure for bluefin tuna. What does it do? High density mature fish, you're ruling that out. They're going to get this valuable fishery. They're going to get the same TAC out of their spawning area, but they're going to take a lot more time to do it. You've got more gear in the water, you've got more bycatch. You're going to catch smaller fish. The selectivity of those fleets is towards smaller fish. You've got two of your conservation problems that are going to get worse, and you're still going to get the same TAC. You shake it through the model, it tells you it's harmful to conservation. Now that's a, a, a space where you would hope, as an advocate for that policy, you could work that through. It's not that easy. But that's why you need to build the model. So you want to make sure that what you're promoting and what you're asking for is consistent with what you want to get. And sometimes, even things that seem obvious aren't obvious. Stock assessment can be worse is a no-brainer for someone like me, but in the states where things are stratified, stocks are stratified, in terms of how much data and how much assessment you can do, this is controversial. But like all models, and all things that can go wrong, you, sometimes you have non-informative data and you get spurious predictions. There are all kinds of circumstances under which the assumptions of a long-term assessment model can be violated and doing something simpler might be better, like a size limit, for example, if you can do it. One issue and thing I take objection to is the idea that we should tier stocks according to data availability. That is not consistent with what we're finding in the operating models. The idea being, in the US and the EU, that you have precautionary buffers and other things set up around how much data, how much data are available for your fishery. That's, there's one reason why I don't like it. First of all, we <coughs> prioritize data collection in the most economically valuable species, right? So we've got most data for the biggest fisheries, most important fisheries. So by tiering by data availability, we're tiering by economic value, we're just laundering it through the idea that there's more or less data. Let's just say what it is. We're, we're putting a priority on the things that are more economically important. The other problem is it doesn't get to the idea of information. Here's a really simple example. This is our true dynamics. It's intricate. It's complicated. We're never going to get there fully. Here's our operating model. We can take three cuts at this, just like we did with urchin, as an example that you're familiar with now. We can know that there's minimal fed discarding. We can know that we have certainty over the size of maturity and it can be enforced. We know nothing else. Whole square parts of this sculpture are left untouched and yet we can have confidence. That's a data limited fishery by US management and yet it is information sufficient. We know we can achieve our management objective knowing just three things that would disqualify it from being considered in certain risk categories. We can spend our, our money doing something else, is what I'm saying. So, there's an allocation of resources issue. In the States, maybe it's less of a problem because they have more resources, but in Canada, it's a serious issue. Here's another example where we've got stable effort historically. We don't have a big overlap in the stock. Perhaps we know that the mode of fishing is going to stay constant. In terms of a risk profile, Potentially, a current effort scenario for the interim is fine. We should focus our effort on something else. So what we're doing now is we don't have one dimension data. We have, we're accounting for all these intricacies in how we assign resources, risk, buffers, and everything else. And that's what DFOs do. And that's what California Department of Fish and Wildlife do. In many ways, DFO and CDFW are charting new territory. They're saying, let's not have some simple stock tiering. Let's build operating models and let's alloc allocate our resources. Let's do our strategic decision making according to these systems models. Because they're co things are complicated and we don't have finite resources. And Quan is doing sturdy work in this regard. He's building 
all these assessments that you could use into a new thing, NSE tool. This is like the evil twin of the DLM tool. And he's building all these assessment models in to work out when you can justify spending the, model, uh, the money and when you could do something more simple. So he's adding that strategic dimension to it. But there's a more serious issue here, and that is like, if we're making decisions, I mean, a public company, if you make a decision that's not transparent and accountable, and it's the wrong decision, you could be fired, right? And that's just a public company. You can buy and sell those shares on the stock market, right? Like, it's not... If we're talking about natural resources managed in perpetuity with, you know, obligatory contributions, taxpayers' money, transparency and accountability seems like a key part of that management process, or should be. And that's exactly what DFO and CDFW are moving towards. They're going to tell you why they're making the decisions they're making. You might disagree with the model, but you can see it. You can see what went into their decision making. So on to the last section, um, inexcusable. I want to be really clear, as quickly as I can, that the inexcusable is not actually productivity susceptibility analysis. Right? Uh, okay. I want that on YouTube or whatever it is. But the, let's talk a little bit about PSA and the idea of something like PSA. This thing was brought into place in the northern corn fishery because there was a legal requirement to evaluate risk to all these bycatch species. So they came up with a tool, it was quick and fast, they could defend it more or less, and it, they went ahead with this thing. And Stabutsky did this, uh, came up with this. A uh, qualitative scoring system where they had seven attributes relating to fishery susceptibility and another six to do with how well the population could recover. And what they did is they said you could add these things up essentially, I think it was multiplicative the first one, and you could get an idea of risk at the end of it. This was later developed into a thing called PSA. It's a very similar idea. This is what it looks like. Look at that reference, by the way, 2007. And sorry this is so small, you don't need to look at the details. All you need to know is that you ended up with seven attributes for productivity and another six for susceptibility. And that you could score them in the one, two, and there's another one all the way over there, three, for each of these things. <clears throat> things are not looking good from my perspective, given the things I've just shown you. Let's start thinking about some of this. First of all, look at the, look at the criteria. First of all, the most of them are static. So you would score a fishery that had never been fished, ever, the same as a fishery that had collapsed, the same as you would score a fishery that had recovered. That means that fishery risk is a function of this and fishing. And that fails a fundamental problem, fundamental feature of a reactive indicator, that it should respond to the thing it's indicating. It doesn't. It doesn't have that link. The next problem is that some of it doesn't make sense. I mean, the big one is, overlap with the species range with the fishery, the first one here says that there's less than 10% of the species range is fished. Well, that's just completely out. Well, you can forget all the rest of the scoring, right? That's a 90% NPA. Now, what you know, so there's stuff like that in here where you're just like, hang on. And then you look at the top and some things to do with, I mean, what has average maximum age got to do with much? The trophic level productivity is controversial. You'll see papers that go both ways on that. So, you know, we looked at this, and I just sat there with Adrian and I thought, we've got to test this. <laughs> like, why don't we map all these ranges onto real operating models and see whether it works? I mean, then we know whether there's at least theoretically consistent. I don't know. So we did it. What, how, what PSA does is it takes the productivity score, which is actually a geometric mean, believe it or not, of all those scores. So this is actually between 1 and 3. And it has the susceptibility score, which is an arithmetic mean. I don't know. And then it says that the risk is Euclidean distance from the origin. This all sounds very technical and proper, but you start to think yourself, they just made this up, right? So, 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 so you're like, oh, okay. And, and in the interim, by the way, there's been all manner of craziness. First of all, the 2007 um, reference, you can't find it. It's a phantom document. It's referenced, but you can't get it. So that's a bit of a worry. So we could never, when we were mapping, find out the original justification for all those attributes. It's really hard. So that's a bit of a worry. The next thing is, this hasn't stopped them in the interim. There's been meetings and meetings. Oh, it should be multiplicative additive. We should add scores. 
you know, we should weight them differently. I mean, everyone's coming up with an idea of what this thing should look like, and yet no one's really worried that it theoretically makes sense at all. It's kind of interesting. So what did we find? A very typical result, we did thousands of simulations, or rather Adrian did thousands of simulations, um, and we found that it was striped in terms of susceptibility. That was the most important attribute determining real risk. So this is the real risk, this is the PSA idealized risk. So we found out that it was really all about susceptibility score. And if you look at it, this corner is supposed to be the same as this. In most of our things, they weren't. And the middle area is a bit of a hodgepodge. If we scoured all the um, simulations we've done, the very best, we ended up with this result up in the top left-hand corner, and the worst was this one here. And it's tempting to look at this and think, well, it's not too bad, until you realize that most of the PSA scores happen in this middle area, where there's a lot of inconsistency, right? So then, what does it look like in general? This is a better representation. So along the bottom, we've got vulnerability and risk. This is the real risk and this is the vulnerability score, you think, okay, that's not, that's not too bad. Like, these are all low vulnerability, low risk. Those are all high vulnerability, that's okay. But where do the scores occur? Typically, they occur here, they almost never occur there, and they 50% of them happen in the middle, where the probability of misdiagnosing risk or not is, wait for it, really freaking high. So 49 to 50 percent classification risk, saying this is a risk, a stock at risk or not. That's flipping a coin, right? More or less, more or less. Okay. So this is this is an issue. So we wrote this paper because not because we're just pedantic and like to criticise things. It's because each. So this is also showing you the scores have an unequal contribution. Don't worry about that. We did it because it's actually used a lot. This is aging in one afternoon, finds 1,400 fisheries where they use this. It's used all over the place. Eco certification, you name it. You see that little label on your seat, your, your you know, halibut burger or whatever it is? You know, it's used all over the place. And no one's ever thought about whether it should intrinsically work. And here's the thing PSA isn't inexcusable, really. They solved the problem. They came up with a solution at the time it's what they had, right? At the time it's what they had. Its use in all these case studies isn't actually inexcusable. What else did they have again? They're not making the tools, they're just applying what they have. The bit that's really inexcusable is that I review something like this today, when there's better alternatives, every three or four months. I get a new one of these in. And of course they're named, these names they come up with. Sustainability Pro Yield Choice Indicator. And you're like, oh, how could I possibly not like that? And you think to yourself, it's just a bunch of additive scores, all added up, wrapped up in a bow of wishful thinking, right? And so you say to yourself, like, it doesn't pass the first test of theoretical consistency. And it's just like, so you get really frustrated. You, you start writing notes as a reviewer to the author, like, how do you sleep at night? You know, it's just, it's, you know you get crazy because. It's not just wrong-headed, really, is it? I mean, these are, this is conservation, this is people's livelihoods, this is food, right? You treat this stuff with the absolute massive amount of respect that you can. But this is not trivial. To propose something that's untested, to just say it works and be okay with that. I'm trying to find diplomatic words to describe how I feel about people doing this stuff, right? Anyway. We're going, to do, we're going to solve this. I'm building an app for the Marine Stewardship Council. They recognize these problems, we're working with them, and the app is just like PSA. You answer a bunch of questions, but it's linked to Adrian's operating model. So it does all this non-linear dynamical stuff and gives you answers that are more defensible theoretically. So the final thoughts. We're at the end, and I've talked really fast, I'm sorry. <laughs> Fisheries management is really complex, and that's just in theory, okay? I think the use of operating models, I started out as a skeptic, I think now they just meet the first requirement of being a transparent account while you're doing what you're doing. I think they can be very helpful. These subjective things like PSA were necessary ones, I don't think they are anymore. Um, and while operating models may be flawed, and you can say, oh, you should treat this like a, you know, what's the word they always use? A, what, what, does a, what does someone who sees into the future look through? Crystal ball. 
<laughs> that's funny, and I get, I get that sentiment totally, I'm a total skeptic, but the question is, what else is there? Like, what, what other model are you using? Is it just Ken and Julie's idea of what a fishery looks like? And when will they ever reconcile those two things? Um, I've got one last slide to put up to burn into the back of your retina because it's been bothering me ever since I've been working with the FAO. So this is vaguely related because it's to do with what we're doing with operating models. And it's so high in the sky, it's such napkin arithmetic, I actually found a napkin with fish on it to describe just how tentative this is. So this is an open question. If Chris Costello is right, and 90% of the world's fishes are data limited, it suddenly looks like this. You've got this little bar of data rich fisheries, right? If it's also really true that, as a paper in Sean Cox I just read, says that in 50% of the remaining cases, we don't really closely follow our stock assessment advice, our, our detailed advice. And if it's really true that in, of the remaining 5%, half have non-stationary population dynamics, i.e. the predictions from a stock assessment model may not be very good predictors at all. If all those things are true, is it possible that the majority of our intellectual, scientific, and other focus capacity is focused on just 2.5% by number of the world's fisheries? Now, economically, this moves a lot, right? This bar would move a lot if we dealt with value, but by number, is this possibly true? So we're building operating models to find data-limited approaches to solve this big what. We're trying to find new things that work in the interim whilst you gather data and other stuff. We're using operating models to basically engage managers and make sure that advice is in a meaningful way that they can follow. Right? And we're also trying to find control theory and other systems that can deal with non-stationarity and population dynamics. We're trying to do all those things. But if fishery science considers itself to be this kind of global discipline, like, like we, we're going to help the world and you know we're everywhere, if that's really true, if we want to think of ourselves as a global scientific endeavor, this is, is I think, is deeply, um, I, I think it's deeply inexcusable, actually. Anyway, um, I'm going to leave that there. It could be wrong, but I just want to like, you know, just sit there for a bit. And I want to thank you all for, for coming. Thank you very much.